Anchor family, great to be with you wherever you might be looking in the day. Listen, I want to make sure that you know that we're praying for you, our online family. And our prayer is this, that you would have just an incredibly wonderful holiday season with your family, all those your loved ones, that this year would be a, a, a Christmas like no other, that you would be filled with the wonder of the Lord and the wonder of the gifts that the Lord gave you around you. Okay, so let's get in the Word. I hope you're ready for Christmas because it's right around the corner. Of course, my wife and I, we're doing something we love to do every year, and that's go out into the shopping center and find the most amazing gifts for our family. Of course, now that we have seven grandkids, oh, baby, we work hard at making sure that we find that perfect gift. That gift, that wow gift, that, oh man, I'm so thankful you got them. Uh, we gave them that gift. I remember a couple of years ago, we got, when the hoverboards came out, we got our grandson, Levi, a hoverboard. And I, I remembered it's like yesterday. He opened this gift up and all of a sudden he came charging at me, just racing at me, jumps into my arms and said, thank you, Papa. Oh, I love it. I can't believe you got this for me. This is amazing. And by the way, that's what exactly what Deb and I were going for when we bought these gifts for these kids. But I submit to you today, as we get into this message, that when we understand the gift that we have in Jesus, we would run to the Father so quickly and wrap our hearts and, around, our hearts and minds around Him so intensely that we would never let go when we understand the beauty of the gift that the Lord has given us in Jesus. And if you're taking notes with me today, the title of my message, the theme of my message is, Jesus is the greatest gift of all. And I want you to know that we're in our Advent series coming into this season. We Advent, of course, is a Latin word meaning the coming. And as we're preparing our hearts for the Christmas season and getting ready to really wrap our minds around this incredible gift in Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas. And we've been using Luke, first, uh, the Christmas story in Luke chapter one and two. But today, today, thinking of Advent, I wanna go back because I don't believe any Christmas story is completely told until you look in Isaiah, the prophet. Do you know that 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about the coming of the Son of God. And if you have your Bibles open today or your Bible apps or going to our app and getting the notes for the day's message, I want us to be looking in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, and it says this, this incredible verse. It says this, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. All the government shall rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now, these words were written a very long time ago, but they're as important then as they are, as they are as important as they are right now. These, these words written by the prophet Isaiah tell us, describe to us the gift that the Father was preparing to give to us on that first Christmas day. So let's look at it. I want us to really look into this word today. I want us to take a journey through this scripture and understand this, the power that the Lord wants us to understand that comes to us as a result of Jesus in our life. So if you're taking notes with me, the first thing I want you to write down today, Jesus came as a gift from God. Jesus came from a, as a gift from God because it said, for unto us, who's that? Unto all of us, all of humanity, unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born. Now, the Christmas story is, it's powerful because it's when heaven invaded earth. When the father sent his son to be, to, for us to understand the, the humanity of God, the compassion of God, the love of God came through Jesus. Now, I'm not sure if you ever thought of God being a gift. Of course, around the Christmas season, we definitely do. I mean, there's a sign in my yard. I've had it there for years. Uh, if you know me, you know that I light my house up pretty intensely. I mean, it gets a lot of traffic and everything's so decorated, all the lights in the, of the Christmas season and people drive by. I light my house for one reason because I have put a sign there for the last 25 
years or so, and it says, Jesus is the greatest gift of all. I want people to drive by my house, but I want them to realize the power that we have in the Son of God. And Jesus is a gift. Over 20 times, actually, in just the New Testament alone, it talks about Jesus being a gift from the Father. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, it says this, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In some of your translations, it would say too wonderful word for words, or maybe it would even say in your, the, the Bible you're looking at right now, inexpressible. In the original language, the word really meant there is no words to describe it, that God is truly the most amazing gift you'll ever receive. Now, when I talk, and I love talking about heaven, you know that, Heaven is a real place, and someday we're going, to re- we're going to be able to experience this incredible place called heaven. But when I think of heaven, and I think of these verses, I, I believe this to be true. 10,000 years from right now, we will still be in heaven marveling, marveling at this incredible gift of the Son, that knowing Him and the salvation through Him and allowing us to have eternity with Him is going to blow our, still blow our minds, that we were so fortunate, so fortunate to be able to be called sons and daughters of God, and it all came through this amazing gift called Jesus. And of course, there's the most popular Bible verse in the, in, in the Word is in John 3, 16, of course, but it's a powerful verse. It really fits into the Christmas story. For God so loved the world. God so loved you and me that he sent, that's the Christmas story, that he sent a gift in his son, that he sent a gift that we would understand. So God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is a powerful statement about who God is. Listen. This Christmas season, I pray, I pray that each one of us in this Anchor family will slow our lives down long enough, like this week, maybe today, maybe this very evening, that we'll slow ourselves and get in a place where we don't let all the pressures of the season, all the things we have to get done, slow us down, slow our lives down long enough to be able to really focus on this amazing gift the Father has given us in His Son. So if you're taking notes with me, the second thing I want you to see in these scriptures is Jesus came to lift our burdens. Jesus, like I said, the Christmas story is about heaven coming to earth so that He would have an intimate, personal, powerful, lasting relationship with you and I. And it says this in Isaiah 6, 9, 6. It says, the governments will rest on his shoulders. What does that mean? The governments will rest on his shoulders. Now, we live today in a democracy. I mean, the people, the president, the governor, the mayor, the legislators on all levels, all get into office because we elect them to be there. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Don't get me started either. So we'll pass on that one. But listen. Here's the deal. We live in a democracy. We don't really understand this whole idea of a king and kingdoms, but here's the reality of this. Hear me when it says the government will rest on his shoulders. You have to understand, yes, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. We're actually of a kingdom. We're from the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He will rule over this world, and he is now, and he will rule all the way through eternity. I think it's really important that you understand that God is the ruler of this world. In fact, these verses say, who will reign, and Jesus will reign. But it also tells us how he'll reign. And if you look in the the scripture, in Isaiah 9, go back a couple verses, in verse 4, let me read that for you. Verse 4, it says this, for you that's Jesus, will break the yoke of slavery and lift the burdens from their shoulders. Who's there? All of us. He will lift the burdens. The way he's going to rule, he, he's not here to put anything on us. He's not everything put, to lay anything heavy on us. He's actually come to lift things off of us, to lift our burdens. Now, as you look in, listen to me today, wherever you might be, 
I'm not sure the burdens that are happening in your life, those things that are pressuring you, those things that are really weighing you down, I don't really know what they are, but God does. Now, in our human nature, we handle those burdens, those issues, those crises in certain ways. First of all, we sometimes just try to grab hold and try to fix them ourselves. We don't rely on anything else but our own abilities. By the way, how's that working for you? I know in my life, there's been a couple of times where just recently that something's come up and I tried to handle it on my own and man, did I make a mess of that. And finally, I had to go, Lord, help, help. And you know what? He was faithful. In other ways, we, we handle our issues. We actually run away from them. We run, and we sometimes, because we're, we're burdened so heavily, so those crises in our life, some things that are going on, we literally run in the arms of things that are not good for us. Drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things to try to relieve us from the pressures of those burdens. Here at Anchor, we've had the privilege of ministering alongside the folks that are coming from what's called Hope Center. It's a men's treatment center. It has been amazing getting to know these men. They are phenomenal men who at once in their life were trapped in the, in the bondage and the burden of abuse, I mean, of, of, uh, of addiction. But the Lord has come in in a powerful way through this ministry in Kailua and their lives have turned completely around, transformed. So now that they're understanding how to handle life's issues without running into the arms of something that will destroy them. And one of the men that I've gotten to know there, powerful story, a pow just mind bogglingly when I heard it, man, it just broke my heart. When this gentleman was very young, three years old, his father passed away. And at age 16, his mother passed away in his arms. That, that blows my mind. And some of the major relationships, his, his grandma and grandpa also passed away. And because, and you can imagine, because of the pain of all that sorrow and some other things that happened in his life, he didn't know how to handle them on his own. And it went, he went into a very destructive, addictive behavior. And then, and then, he met Jesus. He met the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He met a God who was willing to take his burdens from him and transform him into the man he is today. Now, of course, all these guys are still going through it. The enemy's always trying to attack them. But I know one thing. They've understood the gift in Jesus to lift their burdens. I, I love this scripture. Here's, here's an amazing scripture in the word. Always remember, it. it's in Matthew 11. It says this, and Jesus said, this is Jesus' words. I have come to me, it says, come to me all who are weary and carrying a heavy burden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, I will take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is very light. Here's what it's saying. God sent his son to earth to relieve us of the pressures and burdens of our life as we live in this world right now. Allow that gift to work in your life. And if you're taking notes with me, where I want to camp out the rest of our time together, is Jesus came to meet our deepest needs. Jesus came to meet our deepest needs. Of course, first and foremost, without question, Jesus is our Savior. He actually came to earth to take our place on the cross and pay a price that we couldn't possibly afford to pay. And he paid for our sins. So that, and his motivation, in his word it says, it gave me great joy to do it because you know what? He knew he was going to the cross. That was not joyful. But he knew by going to the cross, we, we would never be separated from him and the Father and we allow us to have the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us through life. That is incredible. See, God came, God sent his son so that he would meet our greatest needs. And in Isaiah 9, it says this about Jesus. It says this, that you are going to be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. If you're taking notes with me, Jesus is your wonderful counselor. Now, in the English, looking at this verse, it kind of lets us down a little bit because we can see wonderful counselor. You might think, oh, 
He's a great counselor. He's like, he's got five stars on Yelp. You want to make an appointment to see him. That's for sure. Jump in. I mean, I, I need to see Jesus to counsel me. Yep, he is a great counselor. Absolutely. When we call on him, he's going to give us wisdom. But in this the scripture right here, wonderful counselor, what it really means is that Jesus is the source of all wisdom. Like I said, Jesus came to meet our deepest needs. Our greatest need is to understand what life is about. And what it's saying in Wonderful Counselor is literally, he tells us that he is the substance of all knowledge. John, in the, in the book of John, John being Jesus' best friend, describes him as the word. Jesus is the word. Let me read it for you. In John 1.14, it says this, so the word became human and made his home among us. That Jesus came, John called him the word. So the, in the Greek, the word word means logos. And we get our word logic from it. So follow me with you, would you? So follow me, would you? Here's what it means. See, in the Greek culture and philosophy, of which Paul was a part of, he, he was living in Ephesus, but the Greek philosophy was a part of that time. Of course, the Romans and Greeks and all that went with that. But here, here he's talking, they're talking about the Greek philosophy of life. And the Greek philosophy of life is that everything is through reason and logic and understanding. If you know all those things, you'll know what life is all about. John is using the word logos for a reason, the word word for a reason, that because he wants us, his followers, to know that he is the source of life. One of our greatest needs, of course, is for us to know what life is all about. Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? And what John is saying and what the word is saying, that he is the wonderful counselor. That means he is the source of life. It really means this. Real life is found in the gift of Jesus. And we can spend our whole life looking for what is going on in life. And many people looking, trying to fill the hole in their life, trying to understand it all. And what the word is saying to us, and you know, true life, true purpose, true meaning, true calling in life is only found in Jesus. It also says this, that he is a mighty God, a mighty God. The tra a better translation is that he is warrior God, that he is literally a warrior. It, what it's saying is there's going to be times in our life our greatest need is somebody to fight a battle for us. What it's saying here is he is our warrior. He is going, he's our champion. He is going to rescue us from anything that we find ourselves in. He wants to do that. He wants to war for us. Listen, we live in this world. But you have to understand there's a spirit, we're in, there's spiritual battles going all around us. Sometimes we don't even recognize them. In fact, we see, think it's us or somebody else. We're in a, in, in a fight with them. We're frustrated. We're all those things, all those emotions that are hurting us. And we're thinking it's just between us. But the word says in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, let me read it for you. Ephesians 6, Paul writes, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, warrior power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand against the schemes and strategies of the devil. For we do not fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against the evil spirits. See, sometimes in life, you have to understand, and we have to be ready to understand this, be reticent of the fact there's going to be spiritual battles in our life. And God says, I am showing up. In fact, the word says, when we use his name, Jesus, a name above all names, there's power in his name. When we use his name, the enemy must flee. He will. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, I wake up, my mind's racing, and things just overwhelm me, overwhelm me. I mean, man, I almost in a panic sometimes. I remember not too long ago, I know I, ha I had two meetings. There was something going on in this relationship that I was praying into, but I had, no, I had no ability to change it. They had to change it themselves. But it was still stressing me out. I was still stressed that they couldn't work it out. And there was also 
that in the middle of the night, I'm getting those thoughts. There's also two meetings I had first thing in the morning. And I knew at three o'clock in the morning that I had to cancel one of them because I needed to give both equal attention and I didn't have the time to do that. So in my mind, okay, I've got to disappoint this first guy, but I have to wake up in the morning first thing and I'm going to cancel that first meeting, which I knew he'd be bummed about so I can just have time for both of them and reschedule. So all those things are going on in the middle of the night. I am literally freaking out. And here's what I prayed. And this is the scripture I go to. I, if you, in that same situation where you're freaking out and you need someone to fight for you, read this scripture, know this scripture, own this scripture. It's in Deuteronomy 31. It says, do not be afraid. In some versions, it says, don't panic. And don't be discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you and he will be with you. He will neither fail you or abandon you. In Joshua 1, 9, don't be discouraged don't be disappointed for I with you wherever you go. Here's a deal. I woke up that morning, first thing, kind of still freaking out, but I got up, ran downstairs and I looked at my phone and the first guy, the first guy that I was supposed to meet with texted me and said, oh, I'm so sorry, Rob, please forgive me, but I can't meet this morning. Can we reschedule? Hello. I was ecstatic. Then just a little bit, you know, minutes later, I get a text from the husband of this, this couple that weren't getting along. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's going to be terrible. He said, you wouldn't believe what happened, Pastor Rob. We prayed last night and we've reconciled this relationship. So all night I'm wrestling. I'm in a fight. I'm discouraged. I'm panicking. I'm not sleeping. All I said was, Lord, you need to take care of this. I can't. I'm going to try to get to sleep. I'm giving it to you to war against this spiritual battle going on in my head right now. And the Lord came through and he wants to come through for you. He wants to come for you. He is a mighty God, a warrior. He will rescue you from anything that you find yourself in. Next thing I want to look at, look at this other verse. It says, he's come to be your everlasting father. What a beautiful, what a beautiful title, everlasting father. Now I look out here into this camera and I know that some of us had amazing dads. We're with you, supported you, were there when you, no matter what, unconditionally loved you when you shouldn't have been loved. Great fathers. But also I look out there and I know some of us, they did their best, but their best was definitely didn't measure up to our expectations. And I look out in that camera and I know some of you didn't have fathers. And I know as we look and listen and speak about God being our father, we filter it through our expectations and our past experiences of our dad. But I want you to look in this scripture right now and understand this, clearly understand this, hear me. That a true father is there no matter what. He's there unconditionally. He's there to guide you and to direct you and to encourage you and to be interested in every aspect of your life. That's the quality of a great dad. And what we see in the word, in the word, when we need a dad the most, when we need his hug, when we need him to be there for us, the word says, I am, the, Jesus is going to be absolutely there for you. During the summer in my life, my oldest daughter, Liz, who lives in Texas, was going th is going through something still, but going through something intense. And we're on the phone trying to help that help her through this situation. But at one point, Deb and I realized, no, we have to drop everything here in Hawaii and we have to get on a plane and we have to be face to face with her. We, she needs her mom and dad right now. She needs a hug from us. So we literally dropped everything and went to be in her presence, to experience what she's going through, to let her know that we loved her, to be there, to support her. Listen to me. When there's things that go haywire in your life, and you truly need a hug. You need to be unconditionally loved. But let me just, let me just say one thing other while, we're, while I'm thinking about it. There's sometimes when we think we've done something so outrageous that God couldn't possibly forgive us. That is the furthest thing from the truth. He went to the cross and he only sees us as his beloved children of God. He only sees us that way. He unconditionally loves us. There's nothing you could do. He couldn't love you more than he does right this minute. And he wants, if you need him, he wants to be right there to give you a hug. He is there for you. Look at the scripture. In Psalm 103, it says this, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. 
For he knew you when you were weak. In other words, he knew you from the past. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what you're all about. But you know what? And that's the scripture. He says, no, no, no. But I'm tender and compassionate and I love you. I want to be there for you. He is your wonderful, everlasting father. And lastly, as we look at what God wants to meet our greatest needs, I find it right here. He wants to be the prince of peace in your life. Well, back now, several years, back in when, this, uh, when a Life magazine was still being published, so it's been quite a while now, I read a story, an amazing story. They, the, the editors and the, the journalists for that magazine went out across the world to every nation and people group and every tribe, and he, they asked them this question, what do you want most in life? What do you want most in life? overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, not even a close second, every single person and every single tribe of every single people group and country said this one thing, all I want is peace. I want peace. At our very core of who we are as human beings, and Jesus knows that. That's why it's called, he's called the Prince of Peace. We want peace. This word though, peace, in the English language, it really means the absence of conflict or problems, just everybody getting along. That's what we call peace today. And but can I digress one second here and speak to a small group of people out here looking in today? Some of us live by this mantra, peace at all costs. And we're willing to tolerate a lot of things just to leave, just to make sure there's peace in the home or in the workplace. Can I just look at you and say, Peace at all costs, there is no peace in your life. And if you need help with that, and I've, I've been coaching a few couples through the years here, listen, if you need help with that, reach out to us. We want to help you with that because we want you to find, find true peace. But we're talking about peace here. The word for peace here in this, in this uh, scripture, in Isaiah 9, the Prince of Peace, it's the word shalom. It's a beautiful word in the Hebrew. And so... If you understand the word in shalom, it doesn't mean the absence of something. It actually means the presence of something, shalom. It means that you're experiencing the, ple- the, that you're experiencing the presence, the blessing, the anointing of God in your life, that you're experiencing that. Actually, the word shalom in its truest meaning means to find wholeness, to find safety, and find completeness. And that's what we're talking about here. That in Jesus, that we wouldn't just find the absence of a problem. No, we would find the true meaning of peace. That we, our trust in the Lord, we would find that our lives in the presence of God, we would find wholeness and safety and completeness. Let me just speak into this a moment. Experience the presence of God in our life is incredibly important. Now, we're going at life at a million miles an hour. There's so many different pressures on us, so many different issues, so many different, uh, we have time time constraints and deadlines, all those things. We're barely making it through a day. Some of us, when I say have peace in our life, the last thing, the way we describe the life we're living right now is peace, peaceful. But I just want you to hear me, hear me, hear me, especially in this Christmas season as we experience the wonders of God in our life. True peace is found in God's presence. And having peace with God is critical. And how do you find that that peace with God? By slowing your life down, spending some time alone in a quiet place in his word or in worship or just being quiet before him and just saying, Lord, I just need to be in your arms right now. I just need to be in your presence. If you remember a couple weeks back, I talked about the word presence. And in the Hebrew and the Greek, the word for presence in the Bible actually means face to face. So when we're talking about experiencing this presence, you have to slow down, slow down your life so that you're literally feeling his presence. I ran to Texas to be with my daughter so I could be face to face with her, so I could be in her presence to experience, and she could experience me, and I could experience what she's going through so we could hug it out. And that's exactly what God's saying here. Let me be the shalom of your life. Let me be, and 
When you come into my presence, let me put my arms around you, Jesus says. Let me give you a squeeze when you need it the most. Let me be there when, I, when you need me the most. And that's what the word shalom means. And also, I just want to speak to some of the folks out there who right now would not describe their life as peaceful. That's, there's so much chaos and, and uncertainty going on in your life and you can't find peace. I want you to know, and I want to pray for you in a few minutes here, but I want you to know that true peace, again, is found in God, that you'd have peace with God. This is critical. This is critical to, to really experience life and life to its fullness. To be the best person God created you to be, it must be found in the peace, the shalom of God, that you would find wholeness in Him. Recently, I was coaching this couple and that there was no peace and that's what they came to me about. We just cannot find peace. We are at each other's throat. We're just, we just can't get along. Can somebody please help us? So I said, sure, let me help you. Let me help you. So I said, what's, what's the story? What's happening? And they had, what they had hap happened is they were so busy in their own professions. Both of them, both professionals, amazing jobs, just on their own, uh, just on their own rock stars, but they're trying to get, find it and do it together and they just couldn't find it together. They couldn't take the time to really experience each other's, the, the true beauty of each other. They only came from a very business or career oriented kind of corporate world as they interacted with one another. I said, stop, stop. And I had them go away. I asked them, hey, is there any way you could go away for a weekend? And here was the rule. You could not talk about your jobs. They didn't have any kids yet. You couldn't talk about your jobs. You just couldn't do it. And they went away and I said, all I want you to do is focus on the beauty of one another. Because I, I wanted them to find peace with each other and peace with God. So I said, here's what you're gonna do. I want you to go away and I don't want you to talk about your jobs. I just want you to, to love on each other. Just see the beauty of one another. Express how much each other means to you and then spend some time praying over each other and just kind of rediscover and refresh who you are. They called me up in the middle of their time away in Waikiki, they're at a hotel in Waikiki, and, they, and it goes, Rob, we have found peace. We absolutely fallen in love again because see what happens? What happens when we're going a million miles an hour and there's no peace in our life? We have to stop the train, get off the train, and say, Lord, help me. I need to find peace. I need to find shalom. I need to find wholeness. I need to find completeness. And it's only, hear me, it's only found in Jesus. So today, as we think about this Christmas season and the beauty and the, of the gift of Jesus, the greatest gift of all, God came to be your savior. He came here to bear, bear your burdens and he's come here to meet your deepest needs. When you understand the gift you have in Jesus, when you understand it totally, you would not stop running to him because he wants to be there. He wants to be intimately involved in your life. He wants you to experience his power, his presence, and his peace, and his peace. In this world of so much uncertainty, every day the news is kind of crazy, but God says, you can find peace in me no matter what's going on around you. So today, my prayer for you, everybody looking in as we go into this Christmas right around the corner, experience the birth of Jesus and ex spend a moment commemorating and celebrating that birth because it changed the world. That moment in time changed the world. And guess what? We get to celebrate it because we are his sons and daughters. So let me just say this. If you've never come to a place where you have found peace with God or maybe you're far from God, let me pray for you right now. Lord, I pray for anyone looking in today that has never either come to know you and the peace that you bring or is far from you and, and they went back into that, that shalom, that peace, that wholeness of life. I pray for them right now as they're looking in today, Lord. I pray that you would literally reach down from heaven, reach down from heaven, and you would hug them so tightly that they would tangibly feel your embrace, Lord. And for those who have never come to know you, the peace of God, Lord, I pray for them to, for, that you'd forgive their sins in Jesus' name. Forgive their sins, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that they would experience you this Christmas season of 2021 in a powerful, majestic, miraculous way like never before, Lord. They'd come to know the power of you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And we all said, 
amen. Before I leave you today, I want to remind you that for the next couple of weeks, I'd like to take a special offering for our community. I want to, in 2022, I want to take our love for the community, our light in the community. The, the word says in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 14, we are the light of the world. You're the light of your world. And my desire, my passion is that the Anchor family, if we see a need in our community, I want to meet that need. And it might be financially too much for you to handle. That's where we come in. That's where this offering comes in. We want to have this offering. We're going to set it aside. So when our church family sees a need in the community that needs to be met, like maybe buying some appliances or buying whatever, whatever, whatever that would improve the quality of that person's life, I definitely want to do it. So I would love you to pray. Just pray into it. The word says give, give out of a grateful heart. Don't give, after, give over pressure. I don't want to pressure you, but if you feel led to, so over and above our tithe, I'd love you to consider giving to our Anchor Outreach. You can go to our website and go to our, on our app and give that way under Anchor Outreach. Everything that comes in will be used to make a difference in our community in 2022. So thank you, and I pray that you have a Merry Christmas. Thanks, Pastor Rob. We hope you were blessed and encouraged by this message. Also, if you said yes to Jesus, congratulations. This is truly the best decision you can make. We wanted to remind you that if you jumped in later in the message and missed the chance to participate in the offerings, no worries. There are three easy ways you can worship God through your finances below. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you can know every time we go live. We love you and can't wait for you to join us again. We pray you have an amazing week. Have a great one.